On this week's episode of What the Ship, we look at the top five maritime stories as of October 30th, 2023. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So it's been two weeks since our last What the Ship, and that is because the amount of news that has been coming out in regards to shipping has been at a crazy pace. I've had a hard time keeping up with it and getting videos out, let alone taking a moment and putting together a half hour news show that looks at the top five stories. But that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna look at the top five stories and get you caught up. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So first off, last two weeks, what have we covered? Well, we've covered a ton of things. We've talked about Israel and Gaza and the role of global shipping. We've talked about Maersk new container ships. We talked about the evacuation of Americans from Israel via a cruise ship. Talked about a buddies of mine channel, Life as a U.S. Merchant Mariner. Uh, we talked about Joe Franz's uh, channel. Talked about the Carney and the Red Sea taking out missiles, vampire, 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 which is the call for a missile attack on a vessel. Talked about the Russian Dark Fleet. We talked about strikes on the St. Louis, uh, excuse me, the St. Lawrence. We talked about a North Sea collision on two separate occasions. We talked about a ship cutting cables between Finland, Estonia, and uh, uh, Sweden. And then we, of course, talked more about the global impact of choke points in and around Europe, Asia, and Africa. So a ton going on. So first thing I wanna do is a couple of updates on some stories. First off, great news. The St. Lawrence Seaway is back open. A tentative deal has been reached and shipping is now moving through the canal. This is the story from Reuters. Uh, the union representing St. Lawrence Seaway workers in Eastern Canada said it reached a tentative labor agreement on Sunday, ending a week long strike. This is the Unifor union. They had 360 workers who had stepped off the docks or stepped off the locks, I should say stranding vessels on both sides of the locks, including the USS Marinette, a LCS Freedom class that was trying to get out to the open sea and report to duty before it's decommissioned in the next week or two, probably. But now we have it opening, and this is a big deal because we were coming up against the close of the Great Lakes season. You're looking at about mid-December for that season closing, so really wanted to get those ships up and off. Another story, Three Baltic pipe and cable incidents are related. This is from Reuters. Man, a lot of comments and critiques about my video about the anchor falling off the new, new polar bear. A uh, lot of contention about that. Again, the whole purpose of my video on that is to talk about the fact that it could be an accident. Uh, it is not unheard of for a ship to drop an anchor and then drag it and actually cause this amount of damage. Could it be sabotage? Of course it'd be sabotage. We don't know. But again, I think it's also important that we just don't know the full information at this point. And that vessel is a crappy vessel of epic proportions. And so the concept of them slowly spooling out an anchor, not knowing it, and then dragging it across a series of cables, uh, just not out of the realm of possibility. Then this story about the spirit of Norfolk. NTSB recommends engine room fire systems on small passenger vessel. I'm gonna have the link to the video here that I did on the spirit of Norfolk. If you wanna see a story of heroism, of, of great mariners in action, it is this, the spirit of Norfolk suffered a fire in Norfolk when it was underway with a load of kids on board. The crew responded really well to the fire, but more importantly, it was the neighboring boats came to their action. They got the passengers off and a vessel that had to maneuver around spirit of Norfolk lost their engine and tugs had to catch it before it plowed into the docks at the Norfolk Navy base. Just a epic story. Great one. Uh, but this story from the NTSB is recommending that engine room fire suppression systems be put on smaller vessels. This was an engine room fire. They didn't have the CO2 system necessary. The room was not sealed and this fire got out of control. Then we're seeing the drought continue in different areas. Just saw a story on uh, the Vicksburg Bridge moving a bit because of the low, low water. But here we're seeing stories about the Amazon drought by Bloomberg. And then this story on, <coughs> excuse me, on the Rhine barge rates soaring as the water levels continue to drop. And we're seeing this globally around the world. So a lot of stories we're seeing uh, and we're catching up on. Those are ones that we just had, but also updates to them. I think the biggest one is the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway. All right, let's go ahead and jump to story number two. 
Story number two takes us to Russia, Ukraine. We've been following this since February of 2022. Again, the impact we're seeing, especially with those low water levels coming out of the Mississippi, the Rhine, and the Amazon, is influence, influencing the amount of grain that's out there on the global market. Then you see this, Ukraine ramps up scrutiny of grain exports. There's a Bloomberg story over at G-Captain. Ukraine is imposing tighter controls over grain traders to boost revenues to fund its wartime defenses, a move that may further complicate shipments from the country's Danube and Black Sea ports. Saw a statistic this week that Ukraine's GDP dropped 30% in 2022. That is a traumatic drop in a nation's economy. A lot of that is due to grain and grain shipments. It goes on here, the cabinet ministers will require exporters of grains and oil seeds either to get licenses or to provide tax records going back before the invasion, an official with knowledge of the matter said, asking not to be identified to discuss decrees passed at a government meeting on Friday. It goes on, the government aims to squeeze out fly-by-night companies, repatriate more foreign currency revenue and raise tax collection as Ukraine's international allies, which are providing billions of dollars of aid, scrutinize its anti-corruption efforts. However, the efforts are taking time and costs for traders are racking up as the cargo suffers delays. Remember, the Ukrainian neighbors, Poland, Hungary, Romania, are not really crazy about grain coming into their country competing against their own farmers. And that's the way Ukraine's been getting a lot of grain out, especially with the shutdown of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. However, what we have seen is that Russia, excuse me, Ukraine has been trying to get grain out. They've been going through the Danube ports. And as was said in this story right here, Ukraine insists that the Black Sea shipping corridor remains open. The Ukrainian deputy prime minister denied on Thursday reports by Ukrainian British firms that the new Black Sea export corridor has been suspended. The information regarding the cancellation or unscheduled stoppage of the temporary Ukrainian corridor for the movement of civilian vessels from and to the ports of the big Odessa region is false. All available routes established by the Ukrainian Navy are valid and being used by civilian vessels, which is exactly what Ukraine wants. They need to be using these big bulkers to get the grain out of Odessa and the ports in around them. But then you see this story by uh, Bohan Lepik over at Splash 24-7. Russians drop explosive devices along the Ukrainian grain corridor. The Russian Air Force has reportedly dropped at least four explosive devices into the transport routes of the unilateral Ukrainian grain corridor. It goes on here. For several days, there were no flights of Russian aircraft in the area of sea transportation routes. However, on October 25th, they intensified their activity and dropped four explosive devices. Presumably, it's done to disrupt the movement of civilian vessels and discredit the defense forces of Ukraine as we continue to ensure the security of the humanitarian corridor used by ships from around the world. This is potentially mines, mines being dropped along those waters. Now, NATO has set up a mine sweeping operation by the Black Sea nations, Turkey, Romania, and Bulgaria, to ensure that there are not mines in international and territorial waters of the NATO nations, something that should have been done, I think, a long time ago. But if Russia is dropping mines on the sea route, this has potential jeopardy for cutting this route. Uh, this would be a blockade. This would be trying to interdict international vessels heading into Ukrainian ports. This is something that has not been systematically done. We've seen mines float loose, but we haven't seen efforts to really shut down the ports. Uh, the Russians, while putting vessels and seizing Snake Island across the Gulf of Odessa, have never really officially blockaded. There really has never been an announcement about this. But the impact this has is significant because if Ukraine cannot get its grain out, especially through those big ports in big bulker vessels, 50,000 ton bulkers, this is going to severely impact the Ukrainian economy. You should also note that while Ukraine has announced that they will provide war risk for insurance, which is backed by Lloyd's of London, once you start dropping mines and ships start getting hurt, that doesn't mean that stays in place. And what you could see is potentially ships leave this trade entirely. A lot going on in the Black Sea. All right, let's go to story number three. Story number three takes us to the container sector. And been a lot of interesting stories coming out from the container sector. So I'm a big follower of Freight Waves and Craig Fuller over at Freight Waves. And he's been, and the crew over there at Freight Waves have been documenting what's called the Freight Recession. 
really the collapse of a lot of major truck carriers in and around the United States. Yellow was the big one that just recently failed. And then you saw a freight broker convoy go under. And one of the things that Craig has been very clear about is the issue here hasn't been because of a shortage uh, or, or a decline in freight levels. It's because of overcapacity. There was too much capacity in the trucking market. And that's what makes this make sense. Because when we talk about the fact that we're seeing increases in freight levels coming in by sea, it doesn't make sense that we're seeing collapses on the shore side. But again, you have to look at the entire transportation system holistically. You can't just look at one component. So this story by Lodestar over on GCaptain, ocean carriers hope for rate hike dampen as spot rates spiral. Drury's container spot rate index was a sea of red ink again this week ahead of a planned wave of ocean carrier general rate increases next month. The unrelenting erosion of spot rates will be a particular concern for the Asia and Northern Europe carriers. Remember, there are two types of rates. There are long-term rates. That's 70% of the containers that move. And then there are spot rates. Those are the short-term rates. Those are the rates you get, you book last minute. That's 30%. It goes on here, despite extensive blanking on the, on the route, that means you cancel the sailing of vessels. You're trying to decrease the capacity on the route and thereby artificially increase the, the, the rates. Superseded by the 2M announcement of winter schedules and this week's suspension of a service loop by the Alliance, they seem unable to halt the decline in short-term rates. The Asia-Northern Europe average spot rate shed another 2% this week to $1,004 per 40-foot, while Zentia's average rate for the route edged down 1% to $960 per 40-foot. That's losing 15% as of the month. Meanwhile, after br briefly reacting to the freight of all kind hikes planned for one November, which proposed a doubling of the market rates to about $1,800 per 40-foot containers, appear to have eased the implementation date. Indeed, after being shocked by the size of the rate increase a week ago, UK-based shipping advised the Lodestar they were, was being applied for his Chinese export by all carriers. This week, he was pleasantly surprised. He said, I managed to log in with a couple of lines, and they have all now extended our rates through 18 November. So... There was a planned up rate to take place. This is the long-term rate. A lot of carriers like long-term rates. They don't have to deal with the shock and, and fluctuation of spot rates. However, when spot rates are significantly down and you have a long-term rate that is significantly higher than the spot rate, you're going to go back to your carrier and say, what the hell, I, uh, can I get a difference? And that's what we're seeing here. Meanwhile, the Trans-Pacific container volumes are bouncing back. Remember what happened with LA and Long Beach. Everybody saw that huge line outside of LA and Long Beach. That wasn't a lack of shipping. It had plenty of ships at 109 off LA and Long Beach. The problem we had was the movement from off of LA Long Beach into the interior, to the warehouses, to Ontario, to uh, the Class 1 railway system, onto the highways. If you couldn't get into the Inland Empire and get out of there, that was a problem. Now what we're seeing, U.S. domestic and trans-Pacific carrier Matson has reported solid freight demand despite the muted peak season. Matson is having their Q3 call today. It'll be interesting to hear what they're saying about their freight rates. Uh, they're going to publish them on Monday, but it says it expects net profits of the period to be in the range of 114 to 120 million compared with 266 million same quarter last year. Remember, that was an insane quarter. Everybody was up. Port of Los Angeles posted a jump of 14% in loaded container imports. Gene Soroka, the executive director, with a long-term dock worker contract in place, we're seeing more cargo shifting back. So I asked a question that I have not gotten an answer to yet. Is, is LA and Long Beach, because let me be clear, this is also happening in Long Beach too. We're seeing it happen. So you're seeing Port of Los Angeles increase in numbers in September. Again, Gene talking about the great things. He's saying that we're seeing uh, 748,000 TEU, 20-foot equivalent units. Those are the 20-foot short boxes. Most of what you see are the 40-foot uh, FEUs, tw twice uh, a TEU. Represent a 5.4% increase over 2022. Gene says September was another good month with imports up 14% and exports jumping 55%. Exports are trending up, and that's good news for the U.S. economy is narrowing the trade gap as a positive impact. Seeing the same thing over in the port of Long Beach, Mario Cadero, the CEO there. Consumer confidence is on the rise, and shippers can rely on the port of choice 
Now that we have ratified contract in place with our waterfront workforce, we look forward to a moderate rebound in cargo volume through the end of the year. All right. LA and Long Beach, have you fixed the fundamental problem that plagued you during the container crisis of 2020 to 2022? Both these ports allowed shippers to store their containers on the terminal for long periods of time. They're still doing that. They are allowing these long-term layovers on their terminals, and the terminals are acting like warehouses. That works great for right now. It's one of the draws to come into LA and Long Beach. I can offload my container. It can sit there for nine days, and then I can make the arrangements to ship it and get it out. I don't have to pay for warehousing. I don't have to pay for storage. And even if I have to pay this detention fee, it's, it's small. It's not that big for me to handle. I don't buy that the reason they're seeing the uptick is because of the ILWU agreement. I, I just don't. I think it alleviates a lot of concern. I think the other issue we're seeing right now is a lot of concern in the Middle East going through the Suez Canal. I think we're seeing issues in the Panama Canal with low water levels in the Panama Canal. And the safer route, the safest route right now is the Trans-Pacific route going across and getting in there with missiles flying in the Middle East, with potential conflict in the Eastern Mediterranean, with the Panama Canal the way it is, this is a better, safer route. And shippers have used this route in the past, so they're adapting back to it. Going on here, the inactive container ship fleet surpasses 1 million TEU, Alpha Liner reports. So this is a big uptick right now. They revealed that inactive reached 315 ships, totaling 1.18 million TEU. The majority ships in the inactive fleet, 186 units, or approximately 60%, are marked as being in repair yards, whereas 129 units are considered idle. Remember, massive influx of new container ships flooding the market right now. Between now and 2025, you're going to see a whole new fleet come online. That is key. That is really important to understand. New ships coming in are new feeder vessels, new mid-sized vessels, and these new Neo-Panamax vessels that can go through both the Suez and the Panama Canal. You're seeing a changeover in the fleet. So you can expect to see this continued decline in the number of container ships out there. All right, let's go to story number four. Story number four is a host of stories dealing with the tanker sector and a lot going on with tankers right now. We know we have cut back in oil production by OPEC plus by Russia. Russia has resumed its export of diesel fuel. However, we're seeing a lot of other issues that are impacting this industry. If you're following the stock market prices of tankers, they're up like crazy right now, seeing some peaks, but everybody's worried that we're going to hit the top here and then come crashing back down. This story from Bloomberg over at G Captain IEA predicts global oil demand peaking this decade. Global demand for oil will reach its peak, according to the International Energy Agency, uh, amid growing popularity of electric cars and the cooling of China's economy. The predicted peak, which the agency also anticipates for coal and natural gas, doesn't mean a rapid plunge in fossil fuel consumption is imminent. It will probably be followed by an undilating plateau lasting for many years. IEA does these great reports. I talk about them all the time. This Week in Petroleum, I read it every week. It's a must read. I don't know why people are not reading it. But IEA tracks this globally. And what we're seeing right now is we're supposedly heading for the peak. I'm leery of this too, because I've seen this story many, many, many times before. The question really becomes is what's the alternative fuel out there? And is it readily available? All right. Story number two, Russian crude oil shipments are creeping up again. The flow of Russian oil is climbing again uh, after months of careful adherence to a pact with Saudi Arabia to keep the barrels off the global market. The nation's seaborne crude exports rebounded in the seven days to October 15, boosting four-week average flows to their highest in more than three months. About 3.51 million barrels a day of crude was shipped from Russian ports last week, a rise of about 285,000 barrels a day in the previous seven days. This increase comes from a jump in Black Sea flows to a six-week high and a recovery in shipments from the Arctic port of Murmansk. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Alexander Novak said in early August that Moscow would provide export restrictions at a reduced level of 300,000 barrels a day below their May-June average until the end of the year. Bloomberg calculates shipments through ports should be running now at about 3.28 
million barrels a day. This is a lot of oil. U.S. exports about four million barrels a day. So Russia is a massive exporter of this. Remember, this is what's fueling the Russian economy right now. There's been a lot of issues about Russian oil being shipped over the price cap, the $60 per bar uh, $60 barrel price cap, uh, a lot of actions being done with the dark fleet regarding this. Then you see this, Malaysia detains tankers over illegal STS operations. This is ship to ship transfer operations. Bohan Lepic doing this story. We did a couple of videos on the explosion on board the Pablo, a tanker that was involved in one of these ship to ship transfers. The ship suffered a catastrophic explosion. The ship is still sitting off Malaysia. No one's coming to clean it up. Nobody's coming to salvage it. And now what we see is Malaysia has now detained two vessels. Uh, the vessels are the Artemis III Honduran flag vessel and a Panamanian vessel, the Ocean Hermana, conducting uh, transfers off their waters. Uh, this is a first. We're seeing these. These vessels were supposedly transferring oil, uh, Iranian crude, under, uh, under a sanction. Uh, they've been monitored by the United Against Nuclear Iran uh, organization. They do a lot of tracking of these vessels, and they identified this, posted it, and what we see here is Malaysia finally taking action against it. The problem is there are dozens, if not hundreds, of these operations being taking place worldwide. On another story, tankers line up off of South Africa to ensure diesel power. Uh, South Africa is using ships. About six tankers right now are lined up offshore carrying diesel so as to have a backup because there is lack of storage ashore. Petro SA uh, has taken a process of using floating tankers to ensure that the, the product is readily available and when required according to forecasts. So right now we're seeing South Africa repositioning fuel in their country, seeing this more and more because of disruptions around the world. A lot of countries are building up stockpiles, storing up oil. Uh, the United States has been depleting its stockpile from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We haven't replenished it. Here is South Africa replenishing it with diesel fuel from six tankers. Same time over in Argentina, Argentina threatens to cut fuel exports amid shortages. Argentina's oil producers will be barred from exports unless they increase fuel supplies to address shortages, according to the economy minister and presidential candidate Sergio Massa. If the fuel supply is not resolved by midnight on Tuesday, companies will not be able to send out export ships starting on Wednesday. Remember, the U.S. exporting oil is a new thing. It's only been around since 2015. Exporting LNG, new thing, 2016. And a lot of countries are putting barriers up to make sure they have enough oil and fuel for their own needs. Remember, what caused price spikes in diesel fuel in the United States, principally in the New England mid-Atlantic region, was not because of shortages. You'll hear people scream Jones Act and all that nonsense. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with fuel traders realizing they can sell that same diesel, not in New Jersey or New York, but in Europe for a heck of a lot more money. And so they take that tanker that was going to New York, New Jersey, or that fuel that was going to go into the colonial pipeline, and they ship it overseas, and you wind up paying for more fuel costs. That's the real reason behind it. And then this last story, Freeport LNG gets approval to restart more of export plan in Texas. We have been criminally, criminally slow in getting LNG and other production plants to export oil and liquefied natural gas up to speed. The Maritime Administration has been sitting on applications for this and Freeport LNG, which suffered a uh, massive fire, uh, uh, which shut the plant from June of 2022 to February of 2023, has been trying to get back up to speed. It's one of the biggest LNG export facilities there is. And now they're coming back up to speed with that, which is a really important element. We need to get exporting this fuel out so that we can generate revenue. It's really important. We don't use as the, the LNG that we produce. We, have to, we produce way too much LNG. Uh, that's from fracking and oil and everything. You used, to, you used to burn it off. Now we process it. We take that natural gas, we liquefy it, we ship it overseas. Europe in particularly wants that liquefied natural gas. And so it's really important to get these export facilities up and running. Uh, I think we should be building our own liquefied natural gas carriers so that we can take advantage of that export, move it on U.S. ships, 
U.S. flag vessels with U.S. crews. I have a whole idea behind this that we bring in some temper, uh, some foreign built LNGs for a set period of time, reflag them in while we build LNGs in this country because we built them in the 70s and 80s. So there's no reason we can't build them. We just need a process and a procedure to get them built in the U.S. All right, let's go to our last story. Our last story takes us back to the nexus of Europe, Asia, and Africa. And this story by Mike Schuller, Marad warns ships of multiple projections in the Red Sea. So did a video on this where he talked about the highlights of maritime choke points. Really, really important. This region, uh, which is commonly called the Middle East, it's actually West Africa. I just call it the middle because it is the middle of Asia, Europe, and Africa. It's that intersection point is very volatile right now, particularly for global shipping. And Marad has issued a series of warnings for the Red Sea, for the Black Sea, and for the Persian Gulf. But the thing that we need to be watching that I don't think anybody has on their radar was this story here that kind of flew really low. It's a Bloomberg story. Djibouti rejects Ethiopia's Red Sea port plan. So back in 1993, Eritrea, seceded from Ethiopia. This is the 90s. There was a lot going on. It was the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was the end of communism, the end of the Cold War, the end of history, according to Fukuyama. And so there was a lot going on. And Eritrea and Ethiopia split. Eritrea seceded and took the area along the Red Sea, now making Ethiopia a landlocked country. Ethiopia has no access to the ocean except going through other ports. But now Ethiopia wants a port. They really need access to a port. Do they get to Massawa in Eritrea or do they get to Djibouti as their access point? Here's the map on marine traffic. Here is Ethiopia for you right here. This is Eritrea. This is Massawa, the port of Eritrea. And here is Djibouti. And one of the things you'll notice is this massive line of ships and cargo that just go right past Ethiopia and Eritrea. There's almost no vessel stoppage there. There are vessels coming in and out of Djibouti. Uh, this is a big problem because instability in Africa, a continent that has more wealth, more riches than it knows what to do with, yet has one of the lowest GDPs per, con per uh, nation, is going to be a problem if Ethiopia decides to seize a port. This is a classic war scenario that happens time and time again. Once Ethiopia got cut off from the sea, it is economically stagnated. It needs access to it, and it can only do it by either going through Somalia, Kenya, Eritrea, or Djibouti. And it wants its own port. What stops it from taking military action? We already see instability on the north side of the Bab el Mandab, this narrow little strait here, which I mean is narrow, is right here with Yemen. What happens if Eritrea, Djibouti, and now Ethiopia go into conflict? The Horn of Africa explodes. We saw this over a decade ago when Somalia, after the 1990s, devolved into a state of chaos. Ships coming down the Red Sea out of the Persian Gulf would come in this region. They would dump their waste because no one was regulating this water, contaminated the water, killed off fishing species of numerous type. We saw Chinese fishing fleets and other fishing fleets come in here and over harvest this area. And what you see here is kind of a dead zone now off the coast of Somalia. That could happen in Ethiopia. We need to be looking at these situations because if Ethiopia decides I'm going to seize a port, invades Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, that has implications. And it could lead to a conflict on the very horn of Africa where a good chunk of the world's trade is coming. And again, I, I think we tend to ignore a lot of issues that have global shipping implications. And a conflict in East Africa definitely can. One of the things that got the U.S. early into World War II was we were shipping cargo to the Allies under Lend-Lease. And one of the areas we shipped our cargo to was the Egyptian, excuse me, the uh, British Army in Egypt. We sent ships down around Africa, up along the Horn of Africa, past Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somaliland, which was held by the Italians. We actually had a U.S. ship that was sunk by the Italians off that coast uh, before we entered World War II. This is an area of extreme danger. We just saw it with the shootdown 
of missiles by the Kearney. We now have another vessel in the area, the Thomas Hudner. We just put part of our amphibious ready group, the Bataan, and uh, an LSD uh, that's with them. I think it's the Carter Hall uh, in position near that area. There's a lot of instability in and around that region, and it has everything to do with global shipping. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell to so be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a com comment, share it across social media, give it a big thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and become a patron of the page. To our next video, this is Sal signing off.